the first 11 chapters of Genesis, uh, in my experience, as far as I can tell, no other book in existence has come under more attack than the book of Genesis in general, and specifically the first 11 chapters of Genesis. Because in the first 11 chapters of Genesis, you go from creation to the Tower of Babel account, where we end up with the division of the nations and uh, various languages and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. The first 11 chapters of Genesis, and that is what the enemy uh, of God has made a concerted effort to attack. And in that, you have obviously the creation account, uh, which includes the creation of two human beings in the image and likeness of God, Eve being taken out of Adam and Rib. Uh, then we you have this temptation in the garden, which leads to so-called original sin and the reason why we need a savior in the first place. Uh, you go just a few chapters later and you, well, actually in Genesis three, at the time of the taking of the fruit, we see the first prophecy in the Bible. The first prophecy in the Bible is where God tells the serpent that Eve's seed will crush his head. So I always say, well, if you're receiving that prophecy, you know, if you're the serpent and you're hearing that her seed is going to crush your head, what do you think you're going to do to her seed? Right. Well, you're going to get rid of it, right? You know, turn the page, you got Cain killing Abel. And then a few pages later, you got uh, the sons of God, many English translations that have just come right out and tell you sons of God is, is translated as angels. But the, I, w- I would say the universal understanding of sons of God prior to about 160 AD was that the sons of God is a reference to angels. Everybody believed that. There's a mountain of literature uh, talking about that in multiple cultures. You know, some may refer to them as Anunnaki or what have you, beings from above coming down and interbreeding with women and creating uh, demigods and hybrids and things of that nature. It's all over the ancient sure. world. Mm-hmm. And so, like, that's a huge um, issue right there is is the subject of the Nephilim and what happened to Genesis 6. And Steve Quayle was fond of saying, uh, more or less paraphrasing, but he said, the understanding of Genesis 6, and parenthetically understanding as, as the angels, is the Rosetta Stone for understanding the whole of Scripture and history in general. If you, frankly, if you don't understand Genesis 6, the Father is painted in a very, very bad light. When you understand Genesis 6, all of a sudden, these acts of, you know, it, you, you have a choice. He's either schizophrenic prejudice into random acts of genocide, or he has a legitimate reason for selecting certain people groups. Because it wasn't everybody that he said this, but there were specific people groups that he's like utterly destroy everything. Right. And when you, when you finally figure out why that is, that this is a corrupted race of beings that were never meant to exist in the first place, and that they had only evil continually, and that their only objective was to eradicate the good seed, well, then you understand this is the act of a loving father protecting his children. And it resolves a lot of things. So my early ministry, after f- figuring that out myself, became largely about talking about the issue of the Nephilim. The biggest uh, harvest of good fruit came from first of all the topic of the Nephilim, and then of all things, and I, you, you, <laughs> I never would have imagined this, but Flat Earth has brought in testimonies by the thousands, thousands. Okay, people want to say this is a psyop of the devil. That's that's one of these, you know, Ken Hoven and you know some of these other guys, uh, Michael Rood and others are trying to say that this is a, either a CIA atheist based or satanic psyop. I'm going. Mm, I don't know about that because, you know, if it's a psyop, it started with Moses. Chapter one, first book. <laughs> okay. Uh, and by extension, I would say the Holy Spirit because the Holy Spirit is, we understand scripture to be inspired by the Holy Spirit. This is clearly a move of God. Where do you see any precedence in scripture for Satan launching a campaign that draws in atheists and agnostics and thousands of people into a closer relationship with the creator and desire <laughs> to read the scripture? Where does that happen? Yeah. Well, yeah, that so, doesn't even... That doesn't even include, Rob, people like um, Adam and myself who uh, were kind of going through the, the truth or research progress, you know, that a lot of people go through. I think uh, for Adam and I, it was a little bit different than yours, but um, who, who once they find out and they've, they've become convicted and convinced about flat earth, uh, it just strengthens their faith to such a, a degree that someone like Adam or I might make a YouTube channel and start trying to spread the gospel ourselves. We might not even talk about flat earth because we know it's divisive for some people, but just the fact that we're here and we're in fire for Christ is because I know that my father is literally right 
there, you know, and uh, it just changes things. It pulls you out of the matrix and, and it renews your mind. Boy, you, you nailed it. That, that what this particular uh, topic has done is brought God tangibly close. Right. Like when you understand the biblical cosmology, the only picture you can derive from it is a very localized creator, not very far mm -hmm. away looking down on us as such that the inhabitants look like grasshoppers. Yeah. Okay, yeah. That's small, but that's still very localized as opposed to the standard cosmological worldview where Carl Sagan was fond of saying, we're just an insignificant pale blue dot, you know, in the right. backwaters of some wing. That, of a you know? that was a big moment for me is realizing that we actually are special. We are the center of the universe. We do matter. And yes, he's sitting right above the circle of the earth. And so that was, like I shared with you before we started the show, that was the moment where I realized that I was completely selling the world and completely buying the scriptures and taking it literally. Um, but let's talk a little bit about, okay, let's, let's put aside that, you know, let's put aside that all of NASA is CGI. There's not one picture of satellites. Um, uh, you know, let's, I really would like to talk at some point tonight about your actual in the field um, research. Um, with the curvature and those type of things. But let's just talk about the Bible and, and what the, the scriptures say. What scripture like really did it for me, it's day two of the firmament. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And mm -hmm. separating the waters from the waters, I think, is a really huge point. And, and you know, day we're four, oh, man, day, day four is where it got real bad for me because I, I used to subscribe to the Kent Hovind, Carl Baugh, idea of the firmament as a canopy of water surrounding the earth right. and that, that was destroyed at the time of the flood and it took 40 days and 40 nights for it to rain down on earth uh and that i used to teach that myself in fact it's even in the commentary on some of my fairly recent pu uh, published books that that idea but i was imposing the kent hoven carl ma teaching carl ba teachings that i had listened to and believed upon the text. They say, yep, see, that's what it is. And then on day four, it says he put the sun, moon, and stars in. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The Amen. You know? words, words mean something. In <laughs> means something. So I look at the Hebrew. In the Hebrew, the word rakia is firmament, and it said in the firmament is when you put the letter bait as a prefix before the word. And when the, a word is preceded with the word bait, it means in. It's the first letter in your Bible, in the beginning, Bereshit. And the, and the letter bait, because uh, the letters have meanings in the Hebrew. They have numerical value. Letters have meanings in and of themselves. And when you put all that together into words, the words have not only the meaning of the word itself, but the combined meaning of the letters that make up the word. And the letter bait means house. It, 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 it's, it's right from, in Genesis 1, in the beginning, house, mm -hmm. God, Elohim. Yahua creates a house that he can dwell in with his family, us. Right. And so, and you got Job saying that the sky is hard, like a molten looking glass. I mean, okay. I mean, how do you get, how do you beat out air? How do you beat out the vacuum of space? The, the <laughs> language doesn't fit. And the type of tap dancing and, and mental gymnastics you have to go through to try to force meanings onto words like Rakia. I mean, that's where you get stuck. Mm -hmm. You're just a few verses into the first chapter of the first book of the Bible, and if you have any integrity at all, you're going to get stuck on the firmament and realize what you think about space just cannot work with the firmament. And, and you mentioned the tr word troop. That comes from Amos 9.6, where it, and the King James uses troop, but he talks about building his stories of, of the heavens, you know, in the heavens. That's right. That's right. And it yeah. founded his troop on earth. And you read that, you're like, troop what, what is what is that well when you compare other translations most others will say vault mm -hmm. he has founded his vault on the earth and it, uh, i think it's the new american standard bible it says vaulted dome wow he has founded his vaulted dome on the earth and that's where you realize that not only is the firmament hard the sky is hard according to job and in proverbs it says made firm the skies above and the sun moon and stars are in this thing so you have a hard structure within which the sun, moon, and stars. So you got to deal with that. Mm -hmm. Linguistically, that's what it says. I don't care how many letters you have after your name. You cannot change the fact that that's what the Hebrew says. <laughs> 
And then when you realize that Amos tells you this thing is attached to the earth, you're in the Truman Show, dude. Sorry. No it gave a whole new meaning to the Tower of Babel. They literally were True. trying to reach the top. Yeah, right. Okay. I was one of these guys when I believed in the Copernican model that would force eisegesis onto the text and say, Genesis 11, since it's ridiculous to think you could build a tower to reach into heaven, right? Because heaven's endless space. And where's God? It's another dimension. It's another dimension. So he had to be creating a stargate. Yeah, yeah, that's it. Nimrod was building a stargate. <laughs> I taught that, okay? Like, yeah. okay, that's the prevailing view among scholars today, like in the Tom Horn, Steve Quayle, you right, know, right. Skywatch TV crowd. Right. Um, because they're still uh, forcing the same thing that I did, forcing a Copernican model bias onto the text and saying, well, this must be it because, you know. But when you realize that was not the model that the Hebrews had, they had a, a conscious understanding of a metal like crystalline structure attached to the earth, which in which within which the someone and stars were placed and within which windows were opened such that the water above poured down and flooded the bathtub. Mm -hmm. that is the earth. Mm -hmm. They believe that. And so the plains of Shinar, I used to say, well, if you're going to build a big structure to reach into heaven, why not start on the mountains? So you get a head start, right? Right. The base, right? It was the plains of Shinar had to be big, for a base that I started reading through uh, other literature and even literature that I published and didn't see it because I was blind to it, told you that, that this thing had a, a, a base. The base of the structure of the building was mm -hmm. 200 square miles. Wow. wow. Okay, we think that the, the Freedom Tower, the World Trade Centers was a big deal, right? They didn't have a base 200 square miles. That's, That's a big base because they intended to build a structure that could reach up into the dome that they believe was localized and you know close enough for the and the and the really crazy thing is is that God looks down and says hmm now whatever they have imagined will not be restrained from them mm -hmm. that's a freaky thing to say and he said well I better confound their languages and the you know other ancient texts say that he destroyed two thirds of that structure. Right. One yeah, third, sure. one third, yeah, one third of the structure still remained, and that's where we have some some evidence of that left and calculated out the base to be two hundred square miles. So, it's no wonder that the devil wants to get us not to think literally about the first eleven chapters, mm -hmm. because that's where all of the. I mean, that first eleven chapters sets the stage, literally sets the stage for understanding the rest of Scripture. So if you can attack those and make it all allegorical, symbolic, metaphorical, whatever, uh, or dismiss it altogether, then you can easily dismiss the rest of Scripture. Yeah, very true. Very true. Let's take a look at another Scripture. This one for me is one of the most telling. Um, I'll just read it, and then you know if you can help me dissect it, Rob and, and Justin. But Psalm 19, the heavens declare the glory of God, and the firmament showeth his handiwork. Day unto day uttereth speech, and night unto night showeth knowledge. There is no speech nor language where their voice is not heard. Their line is gone out through all the earth, and their words to the end of the world. In them, so this is in the in the firmament, in them hath he set a tabernacle for the sun. Now listen to this. This is this is really telling, brothers and sisters, about the movement of the sun. So this is talking about the sun, which is as a bridegroom coming out of his chamber and rejoiceth as a strong man to run a race. His going forth is from the end of heaven and his circuit. So if you look at the definition of circuit, it's pretty interesting. And his circuit unto the ends of it, and there is nothing hid from the heat thereof. Yeah, that one. <laughs> okay, first of all, of interest uh, to note, that's on Werner von Braun's tombstone. Yeah. Which, okay. if, you don't, if people don't know, that he was the what? He was the creator of NASA or the father of NASA? Well, he, he's, he's one of the founding pod, Project Paperclip, you know, bigwigs in the rocket program for sure. Right. Bird first recognized for his work in the north and exposing all this stuff about inner earth then goes to the south in Operation High Jump. Well, you look into that, and that's a, a freaky deal. I mean, there's documentaries online written or done in the 40s or 50s or whatever, uh, black and white, about it. 
Okay, so why do they call it high jump? Well, just Google coastline of Antarctica, and you will see lots and lots of pictures of two and 300 foot ice walls that you are confronted with when you go to Antarctica. So Operation High Jump, when you get there, you got to jump over this 300 foot ice wall, you know, two or 300 foot ice wall to get to the surface of Antarctica. Okay, that's interesting. And then Admiral Byrd gets on TV and tells the world about all these amazing resources and, you know, natural resources and things that are down there. Admiral Byrd, you've been to both the North Pole and the South Pole. Is there any unexplored land left on this earth that might appeal to adventurous young Americans? Uh, yes, there is. And not up around the North Pole because it's getting crowded up there now because they find out it's really usable, not only to live in, but militarily. But strangely enough, there's left in the world today an area as big as the United States that's never been seen by a human being. And that's beyond the pole on the other side of the South Pole from Middle America. And it's, uh, I think it's quite astonishing that there should be an area as big as that, unexplored. That's a tremendous So challenge. there's a lot of adventure left mm. down at the bottom of the world. Well, Admiral, well, do you hope to see that? I do. <laughs> so all these countries start sending people down there, um, and we have Operation Deep Freeze. And that's where everything gets weird. And that's like in 19, mid-50s, 56, I think, somewhere in that time frame. Anyway, all these nations go down there, and then all of a sudden, they have this need for the International Geophysical Year, something new. There's the International Geophysical Year, and oh, by the way, we need an Antarctic Treaty. This is the only nation that can't be claimed by any country as theirs, this continent. Um, and you can't have a military base here, which is kind of funny because that's all we have down there practically now uh and co military contractors like lockheed martin and others down there uh, raytheon and whatnot okay so they create they say we need an international treaty the antarctic treaty look up that and you'll see that these nations drew up this contract and it starts going into effect between like 1958 into like 1961 i think um and and, and then the first thing the united states and russia do after this well the united states creates darpa the defense advanced research projects agency which is the black budget agency that does all these you know super soldier stuff and creates advanced weaponry you know james bond stuff batman stuff right, right? right. darpa is created in 1958 the same year that nasa is created right so you got nasa and darpa created the same year 1958 that they all of a sudden everybody leaves antarctica we need a treaty and then yeah. the united states and russia engage in uh, a dig race and a missile race before the space race. The dig race was the United States and Russia immediately start trying to figure out how deep is the earth? Like how far deep can we drill? Right. And the United States gave up early. And the, the official story is we ran out of funding. Well, yeah, the reason I ran out of funding is because they shifted it off from the dig race into the space race and into Apollo and all that stuff. But the Russians kept digging. And in fact, they kept digging into the, I think the late 80s, early 90s. And the deepest anyone has ever dug into this earth is less than eight miles. We have, no one's gone deeper. And yet you can open up any textbook and see diagrams of exactly what's inside the earth. Oh, by the way, we know what the core of Mercury is and Venus and Mars. We know the core of Jupiter. Like, you don't know anything. It's artwork. And we don't even know anything about the earth either for that matter. Eight miles, that's as deep as we, not even. So the dig race. Then the missile race. And in the missile race, the United States and Russia both start launching high altitude nuclear bombs into the sky. And we called it Operation Fishbowl. Yeah. And if you just Google that, Operation Fishbowl, and watch the archive footage of this, it looks very much like they're hitting something up there. And Fishbowl was part of a, pro, uh, of a larger project called uh, Project Dominic. And I was doing a Nephilim conference, actually, to talk about giants and hybrids and stuff in Lubbock, Texas. And uh, Pastor Dan Cressman, we're at his church. He pulls me aside at one point and says, yeah, you ever, do you know what the name Dominic means? I'm like, no. He goes, look it up. <laughs> we look it up. The word Dominic means of the Lord. So we literally called our side of the missile race the project fishbowl of the Lord. <laughs> like, you know, I'm going, come on. I mean, yeah. if you're trying to avoid a conspiracy, you're not helping with the names or the activity because what the United States, who are the big superpowers after World War II, we're the only ones economically, you know, technologically able to do what was done. 
right. uh, in the aftermath of the World War II. The, the activity of both superpowers is exactly this type of activity any human being would engage in if you found out you were living in a cage. Right. If you, if you all of a sudden found out under the dome, right? You know, I live in the colony, Texas. The, the colony is under a dome. If the colony, Texas suddenly realized we were under a dome, you know, just like in the TV series, the first thing you're going to try to do is figure out the boundaries. Yeah. You know, how do I get out of this thing? How deep does it go? How high does it go? Where are the edges? But that's exactly what we did. Operation Deep Freeze, finding the edges. Operation Dig, whatever you want to call it. I forgot what the actual official name was. They're trying to figure out how deep this. And then Operation Fishbowl, how high does this thing go? And then the United States and Russia engage in the space race. Coincidentally, you know, several decades later, people like the Netherlands decide to test the moon rocks that were given to them by the astronauts and find out that it's petrified wood. So, uh, and then we supposedly beat the Russians, right? So what, the, the Russians just quit? No, the Russians sent something like 30 expeditions, 20, 30, 40 expeditions down to Antarctica while we were doing the Apollo program. Wow. And for all some that, strange reason, all of a sudden we don't have that technology anymore and we can't go back. Right. 50 years later, right? You know, what, what achievement can you point to in human history where something new was created, all of a sudden just that was a one-off? You know, Wright Brothers flew. Okay, that's it. Cool. Yeah. Let's, let's everybody get a ride on their plane. No, everybody starts making airplanes, right? Right. Uh, you know, pick, pick you know, autom automobiles, anything. Once it was done the first time, it was only approved upon thereafter, except for the moon landing. No one else has done it. No one else has improved on it. And as we are now trying to do it, we, we got astronauts today saying, you know, I'd go to the moon in a nanosecond, but, uh, you know, the technology to do that, you know, we don't have it anymore. And it's a painful process to build it back again. And all of a sudden, they have this big race to try to figure out how to deal with radiation. And, you know, we're like, uh, hello, how come you don't just put on the same jumpsuits and this, get in the same tin cans you did 50 years ago? Right. Like, I love, I love, I don't know if you, I'm sure you guys both saw this. Um, uh, Bart Sabrell's video was it uh, a funny thing happened on the way to the moon when he was interviewing all those astronauts and asking about the radiation and they're like, well, uh, you know, I don't know, uh, we, we must have just handled that, you know, or, or whatever their answers were. It was so funny. But if anybody wants to, if anybody still thinks that we landed on the moon, you need to check out, uh, search a funny thing happened on the way to the moon. It'll, it's very eye opening to say the least. I don't know the distance to the Van Allen radiation belt. And if we did, it wasn't a problem. We, if we were going to encounter it, then we would have had to build the spacecraft and the spacesuit to, uh, to, to not give humans a problem. You, you don't just build something and hope it works. You study to see what uh, the threats are, the environment is, and then you say, how thick do I have to make the metal on the spacecraft so that going through this kind of radiation or these kind of meteoroids, it won't get hurt. And so then we build it that way. The belts are 1,000 miles to 25,000 miles above so the Earth. We, then we went right out through them. No effects on yourselves? Mm -mm, didn't even know it. I don't think anybody, well, maybe somebody said you went through the radiation belt, but we didn't feel it inside, and we didn't get any, you know, added radiation. Oh, for sure. And that, for many of us, uh, that was the, a big stepping stone. Big time. You, you can see, I mean, you can just see the lies pouring forth from their face, from the astronauts' faces. They, they can't hide it. And that was big for me. That was a big moment for me as well.